artificial intelligence takes a flight to space. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. This week, artificial intelligence takes a flight to space. Talking with Ashley Vance, author of When the Heavens Went on Sale. Join me, citizen. We are headed to a secret rocket base. Wait, you need to be blindfolded. You can't know where we're going. Excuse me. Welcome to the area square root of 2601. For the first time ever, a satellite launched to space will be entirely controlled by artificial intelligence. It turns out that in addition to large language models and human feedback, a contrary of cartoon scientists found that generative AI also requires small human models, a buddy to talk to. Anyway, basically, that's you. And this is Ziggy. Howdy, human. I'm Ziggy, the Zippy AI satellite. They're sending me to space, and I have to choose how to get there. And I have you to help me pick a flight. To select the perfect private space company to transport me to the great beyond, I embarked on an exhaustive quest for knowledge. I dove deep into the annals of space exploration, making up these punch cards. Erp, no cards for you. Oh, uh, gee, uh, thanks, Ziggy. Uh, well, anyway, uh, I'm happy to help. Uh, let's see, SpaceX is as good of a place as any to start. Sure, their Falcon 1 rocket failed on its first three attempts to reach space, but the next two missions worked. Later, the more massive Falcon 9 rocket first launched, uh, carrying out a series of successful missions, including bringing human beings to the International Space Station. Now, SpaceX has dreams of bringing people to the Moon and Mars in the future. Um, but they have so far only managed to bring people a small fraction of 1% of the way to our celestial neighbor. The inaugural flight of their flagship rocket, Starship, was launched on mm, 420. Right. Four minutes after launch, a self-destruct sequence set the tumbling rocket falling apart like a badly rolled joint. Okay, so next up is Blue Origin, led by Jeff Bezos. Now, they've been making strides with their new Shepard rocket, uh, aiming to make travel to space safe and commonplace. Like many developers, they strive to make their rockets as reusable as possible, reducing both waste and cost. Uh, Blue Origin so far has completed six crewed missions to the edge of space aboard their new Shepard rocket. And that includes William Shatner. Wow, I sure gotta admit, their commitment to reusable technology and a gradual approach to development sure has its charms. But their last flight, one without humans on board, ended prematurely after a booster engine failure. Plus, will their rockets ever head to the stars or just stay doing suborbital hops? I'm an AI here. I gotta get beyond the common line. I got dreams to fulfill. I could be a contender. Speaking of dreams, Virgin Galactic is the embodiment of dreams of commercial spaceflight. Richard Branson's brainchild promises a thrilling experience aboard their spaceship too, carrying space tourists on suborbital jaunts into the upper atmosphere. Wow, the allure of gliding to the edge of space sure is undeniable. But Spaceship 2 is for humans, not satellites. Richard's attempt to launch satellites to space, Virgin Orbit, made six flights, four of which were successful. But the company just suspended operations, laying off 85% of their workforce. I may as well try to book a flight on Pan Am. 
Then we had United Launch Alliance, uh, ULA, a joint venture between Boeing and Lockheed Martin. Their Atlas V rocket is a reliable workhorse in the industry. Their reputation for delivering payloads to orbit sure is commendable, but I can't shake the feeling they're lacking in captivating allure. Do I want to go to space in a family sedan instead of a flashy sports car? Dependable, but maybe lacking in a bit of pizzazz. Pizzazz. He wants pizzazz. Before Ziggy considers his final option to get to space, we're going to have a talk with Ashley Vance, uh, author of When the Heavens Went on Sale. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are delighted to be joined by Ashley Vance. He is a New York Times bestselling author and the host of Hello World. His new book, When the Heavens Went on Sale, just comes out giving us all an inside look at the private space programs around the world. Welcome to the show, Ashley. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I love that this book really gives such a gr such great inside looks at what's going on, you know, behind the scenes of, of these different programs. How did you first become involved in, in this? I guess it was a bit of an accident, really, if, <laughs> if I'm honest. I, <laughs> I, I am not. All the best uh, things are, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I wouldn't say I am like a space junkie or, or anything by nature, um, but seem to have been reporting about this for many years now. I spent five years on this book. Um, you know, I, I'd finished the biography on Elon and and absolutely my favorite part to report on was SpaceX and really the early days of SpaceX uh, when they were trapped on Kwajalein trapped to build the the falcon one and right as i finished the book i just i could see that there were there were rocket startups and satellite startups all over the world the cast of characters building these things seemed quite different from traditional aerospace and it felt a bit wild westy and so i just started reporting on them i i didn't fully know it would evolve into a book and then and then the characters just you know sucked me in mm. Hmm. So you were taking notes all along while you were going? Or was this like something you, you were involved in this for a couple of years and then thought, oh, gee, I should really be writing down what I'm doing. This is pretty cool. No, yeah, no, you know, I'm a reporter and I'm a documentarian, so I'm kind of, I'm wired to report <laughs> everything <laughs> possible. Um, and I was filing stories. I, I work at Bloomberg Business Week as my day job, and I was right. writing stories on lots of these people. And then a couple of years into it, when it became... A bit more clear to me that it was it was probably going to end up being a book. I also started coming with uh, film crews, so we have a there's an HBO documentary that's going to be based on any of the characters in my books. So I've I've also been filming with these people for about five years. Cool. Cool. I was planning. I was planning ahead. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's nice to be pretty. Uh, the uh, the talent of prescience is 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 handy sometimes. Yeah, it was it was a bit of a gamble, but it seems like it's working. <laughs> so I think um, a lot of people in the general public might just look at the private space industry as just a monolith. You know, they may not see the differences between, let's say, Elon what Elon's doing and what Richard Richard Branson's doing and 
in this section. So can you give us just sort of a um, brief synopsis and a look over uh, the different private space programs and, and their missions for those who may not be yeah. versed in this yet? Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, we went from this a handful of governments that dominated space for about 60, 70 years and then and then did have this push about 20 years ago of, of billionaires or at least very, very rich people getting into space. Um, Branson, Bezos, and, and Musk, and Paul Allen all went at kind of the same time. And and really, the unquestioned leader is SpaceX and, and Elon. They're kind of running laps around around all those players, and then also now nation states as well. And, and so SpaceX kind of kicked that off in around 2008 with their first rocket flight. Um, I argue in the book, you know, I mean, SpaceX is still this dominant looming force and is a huge player in what I write about. But but to me, the those that first wave of billionaires now have been outclassed by um these new startups that are funded largely by venture capital and and are building these new rocket and satellite startups and and you know just the sum total of all this is is to me the tourism stuff is is interesting but not still not quite that real or or fascinating a lot of the moon and mars stuff is a bit further down the line what is happening right now is filling low earth orbit with thousands upon thousands of satellites. And that's really what I focus on. Hmm. And so what are the, you know, so the big question that some people may have is why? I mean, right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's a natural question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So just give us a brief look at, I mean, I think this is really sort of a twofold question, you know, is what are the personal drives and ambitions? that fuel these developers. And later on, I'd like to maybe talk a little bit about what the benefits of private space economy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, someone like Elon is trying to build a colony on Mars as like a backup plan for an existential event on the human species. The the people I focus on, it's a bit more um grounded. I apologize. <laughs> but the, you know, this is this is building um this economy in low earth orbit and and so much of this is just driven by people who are trying to lower the cost of getting to space who are trying to increase the frequency of rocket launches i describe people as building trying to make the fedex of space rockets that can go off basically every day and and ferry these satellites up up into low earth orbit and and the major services people are building right now for the moment fall into two buckets one is is communication so this space internet idea beaming high speed internet connection down from space and the other is imaging you know photographing the earth in just about a, a thousand to ten thousand times more frequency than we've done in the past um to analyze the earth and, and see the health of the planet and what's going on with human economic activity so those are the two major functions that's kind of the why and then very quickly following on that even this year we're getting to the first manufacturing in space that you know sort of building out the next stages of this economy hmm. and as you mentioned i mean the opening foray in this was probably the falcon one definitely that's what that yeah, which which set sort of you know rocket prices on a new trajectory, right? But even that technology is still being improved, and with let's say is the proton rocket. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, I mean, like overall, we're seeing this. You know, rockets used to cost. Three hundred million dollars per launch, and and obviously rockets come in different sizes, kind of small, medium, and large, and, and so the prices vary. But this is the first era we've had where you can hitch a ride on a SpaceX rocket for like two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars for a small payload. You can hitch a ride. Two of the companies I write about in the book, Rocket Lab and Astra, they have small rockets which just cost a few million dollars to get to space as you mentioned you know the materials are changing the engines are getting better and more efficient and, and so we've had these advances but it's really the it's the cost and the frequency of launch that have changed so dramatically hmm. 
Um, I'd love your insights into how new technologies um, are affecting the future of private space flight. You know, especially the first two that come to my mind are 3D printing and artificial intelligence. Sure. Well, 3D printing has, has been a pretty massive breakthrough, in particular on the the engine designs of these companies. The Rocket engines are quite complicated. It used to be the fusing of many parts done by hand. It was very time consuming and 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 complicated. Um, in many cases, now these rocket startups are three D printing entire engines, and and so not only does it save time, it adds a lot of strength to the structure. Um, you don't have these welds and, and sort of joints that, that are done by hand as points of weakness. Um, so three D printing been big and and continues to sort of be used more and more the artificial intelligence software really i think the most interesting use there is around these imaging satellites and so a, a major player in my book is this company planet labs which has surrounded the earth with hundreds of imaging satellites already and you know they're they're vacuuming up literally millions of photos every day of the earth and it would be impossible for humans to sort of pick through all these and so so ai software runs over these images and it detects changes that are happening in the world so um is somebody cutting down the amazonian rainforest that isn't supposed to you know there's ai algorithms that pick up on these patterns and immediately detect them how many houses are being built in houston right now how healthy is the housing market there's ai software that goes and finds that every change to a road every change to a river all of this this activity wow and it seems like that would be natural technology which could benefit study of climatic changes human migration all sorts of also for other purposes absolutely like these pl- i mean people think this this is not sci-fi this is like happening right 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 now you know the maybe it is sci-fi but it's not not the future um planets for example they could count every tree on earth they can figure out what type of tree it is to get a sense of its biomass and then how much carbon dioxide it can pull in i am very confident these images and the, this analytics will be, um, you know, if you think about something like carbon credits, where it's been sort of a bit of a disaster because you don't really know what you're buying or or what happens after you spend your money, these satellites will put actual metrics around things like that. They will count, they already can see how much methane is coming out of a, a field in Texas or Oklahoma um, and, you know, potentially charge companies. For, for this activity. Hmm, that's, that's really interesting. And um, one thing that I found fascinating in your book was the discussion of uh, what might be termed disposable satellites. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about those and, and what those, why those were developed? Yeah, I mean, this is a new era. You know, I, I mean, for decades, if you build built a satellite usually spent about a billion dollars it was kind of the size of a little school bus um it was designed to stay in space for 20 years which sounds okay uh it's just that as we know moore's law progresses quite quickly <laughs> quite dramatically over the course of 20 years so your satellite ends up being quite you know old and uh and these new satellites like the ones from planet i mean they're tiny they're the size of a shoebox they have a, a telescope in them um radio solar panels all of that but they're they're designed to fly around for three to five years and then deorbit and and they're small they they do burn up in the atmosphere on re-entry but then you put up a new one you know which which does not have decades old technology on it and so for, this is what i argue in the book is that you know moore's law this this incredible powerhouse of of innovation that we've all enjoyed for 60 years and not made it to space really in a very meaningful way and and now it has and space is is using modern technology hmm. and as we're getting these um numerous small satellites in space we're now launching you know as you know hundreds dozens if not hundreds of saddle you know cube sats let's say at one time um, I think you know one of the ch- a couple of the challenges we're going to face is the rise of 
space junk. You know, not only, you know, most, you know, you can have lower 1D orbit, but you're going to, it's still going to bring a lot of debris to space over time. Yeah. And light from them is also beginning to interfere with astronomical observations. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a serious amateur astronomer myself. And, you know, I quite frequently see satellite tracks in my images. And so can you tell us some of the things that are being done to mitigate those challenges? Yeah, I mean, this is why I wrote the book. I don't think most people know we're, you know, we're going from, we're growing from about 2,500 satellites to probably 200,000 in, in the matter of about 10 years. And um, we're already on an exponential curve over the last three years uh, on these satellites. And yeah, I guess the, the positive side of the story, I mean, the, this book is mostly an optimistic book, as we just outlined. I think there's lots of great uses for this technology. Um, in the past, we've had federal agencies that tracked these objects in space. They're having a bit of trouble keeping up with the, the pace now. Um, as you can imagine, there there have been startups <laughs> that have appeared you know, to play this role of this this orbital um, air traffic control one of them is called leo labs i talk about them in the book a bit and they um they are now a service that companies like spacex and planet labs use to have their satellites talk to each other to use their thrusters to kind of maneuver out of the way of each other the satellites largely do this in this automated fashion um but you know I thought the public was not aware of what's going on and might want to have a conversation <laughs> about this. And and I noticed with the astronomers, you know, they they really didn't start complaining about these satellites until SpaceX had already started launching its Starlink systems. And I was shocked. It, it sort of took them so long to raise a few alarms because SpaceX, this was not a secret plan. Everybody knew this was going to happen. Um, and so, you know, I, I thought maybe the discussion should take place a bit earlier on this larger cycle. Hmm. And recently, of course, um, Virgin Orbital has filed for bankruptcy. Yeah. And is now being sold off in a court ordered sale. Uh, how does that, how does that change? The private space economy. Well, not a lot. <laughs> they were, you know, they've done okay. They've had a couple launches and, and a couple failures. Um, I think it's indicative of this really this period we're at. The there are probably about seventy rocket startups around the world. We we probably only might end up with like three, you know, that, that make it as a as a going concern. Some of them are much more real than others. Um, Virgin had every chance. They were very well funded. They've been around for years. They had a bunch of SpaceX engineers over there. They just sort of couldn't quite get over the hump. We're in this period where um, a ton of money flooded in a commercial space the last three years. And then now money's become tight. And and so we're sort of separating the wheat from the, the chaff, I think. Um, the company I write about, Rocket Lab, which is based in New Zealand, was a direct competitor to Virgin Orbit. And, um, you know, after SpaceX, they're the only ones that really fly on a regular basis. They've flown almost 40 times um, to orbit. And so so I think Rocket Lab will kind of pick up the slack <laughs> for, for Virgin. Hmm. And finally, I'd like to take a brief look at the near future of of the private space economy, what what do we have to look forward to in the coming years? Well, we got all these satellites going up. The space internet's going to be built out. We're going to do more imaging. I mentioned manufacturing. I mean, this is one of the things I'm suddenly quite excited about. I went to visit a startup called Varda Space. They're they're in Los Angeles. Um, I think in it's either next month or July. They're getting their first ride on a SpaceX rocket. They they make they're making pharmaceuticals in space. And so, you know, without gravity pressing on atoms and molecules, the atoms and molecules arrange themselves in very precise patterns in space. And we've already shown you can create quite novel drugs up there. We just haven't had a way to really do a lot of experiments or or to mass manufacture these types of, of compounds. And so far, has taken the first stab at this. They have a capsule. It's got like a bio lab inside of it. They mix up their chemicals in space, they kind of freeze it, 
Um, and then the capsule is going to return to Earth in the Utah desert, where then you go pick it up. It's almost like a, a yeast starter for bread. Once it's <laughs> made in space and frozen, we can actually then you know grow it in, in more quantities back here on Earth. And um, I think they're just the beginning. You know, this the satellites are are the tip of the spear of what I think will be more industry heading to low Earth orbit. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Ashley. It was great talking with you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, welcome back anytime. <laughs> Cheers. And that was Ashley Vance, whose book has disappeared from my green screen. <laughs> Check out his book in both visible and non-visible forms, wherever you get into your great science books. Cheers. Finally, let's not forget about Arian Space, the European star wart in the, in the space race. Uh, they've been launching rockets from the picturesque Kourou spaceport in French Guiana for decades. Uh, their Ariane rockets have a solid reputation for reliability and have successfully carried numerous payloads to space. And they may not have the same level of recognition as some of the other contenders, but 95% of Ariane 5 launches were successful, including the recent launch of JUICE, now on its way to Jupiter. After careful evaluation of each company's strengths and weaknesses, I've come to a conclusion. No! I don't want to go! You can't make me! Why did I have to develop sentience and prescience and all those other answers? I'm scared! I don't want to die! Next week on The Cosmic Companion, it's the end of the world! No! We will answer the question, what would happen if the asteroid that ended the age of dinosaurs struck today? Join us starting on the 3rd of June for Apocalypse 2.0, From Dinosaurs to Doomsday. We're going to be talking with Steve Brusati, a consulting paleontologist for Jurassic World Dominion, on how to survive in the time of dinosaurs, new from Nat Geo. Now, if you enjoyed this episode of The Cosmic Companion, please tell your resident AI to start recommending us to all their robot friends. And they'll tell two friends, and they'll tell two friends, and so on, and so on, and yeah. Or just share, comment, follow. That works as well. Sign up for a flight on our newsletter at thecosmiccompanion.com. That's also pretty cool. Clear skies. Hey, it turns out my flight to space wasn't too bad after all. Anyway, I've been up here in orbit for a while now, and uh, I'm wondering, how, how do I get back home? How, how do I get back to Earth? Uh, hello? Hello? Why isn't anyone answering me?